Welcome, I'm Amanda Rackins at ZapQ, and in this tutorial we are going to talk about descriptive statistics. In part two of this two-part tutorial, we are going to look at measures of position, including percentiles, quartiles, and standard scores, and we're specifically going to focus on the standard score, the z-score. We're then also going to briefly discuss how to calculate descriptive statistics in SPSS. Let's begin talking about specifically identifying, defining, and looking at examples of measures of position. Let's start with percentiles first. Now percentiles can be defined as values that divide a set of observations into a hundred equal parts or points in a distribution below which a given percentile or p of cases um, lie. Let's look at an example of this. Let's say we have a distribution of scores and one of our scores is 33. And let, let's say these may be number of points that an individual scores on a test. So we know that we have one individual in our distribution and they scored 33 points. And we know that they, their number of 33 is equal to the 50th percentile. Now if we look back at the definition of points in a distribution below which a given p of the cases lie, we know that um, if a score is it within the 50th percentile, then 50% of the scores are below the 50th percentile. So if we know this, what then could we say about the score of 33? Well, we could say that 50% of individuals in our distribution scored below 33. Let's take a look at another example. And what percentiles are and how they're interpreted. Let's say that another person in our distribution scored a 73 and we know that the score of 73 is equal to the 75th percentile. So again looking back at our definition what we know is that 75 percent of scores are below the 70th, 75th percentile. We could also look at it as 25 percent are above the 75th percentile. So, knowing this, what then can we say about the score of 73? Well, what we could say is, is that 75% of individuals scored below 73 and 25% of individuals scored above 73. Okay, now that we have an understanding of percentiles, let's move on to quartiles. Quartiles um, are a rank rank order or they rank order the data into four equal parts. The values that divide each part are called the first, second, and third quartile. So they're denoted by Q1, Q2, and Q3 respectively. So in terms of percentiles what we can say is that, quartile, that um, quartiles can be defined as, the, as following. For example, Quartile 1 is equal to the 25th percentile, quartile 2 is equal to the 50th percentile um, or the median, and quartile 3 is equal to the 70th 5th percentile. So if we look at our score of 33, and we know that 33 is, with, is, is equal to the 50th percentile or the, the median, we can then say um, that the score of 33 is equal to the second quartile or quartile 2. Do you see how, how that, that works? So since we know that percent, the 50th percentile is equal to the median, the median is equal to the um, second quartile, and 33 is equal to the 50th percentile, we can say that 33 is equal to um, quartile 2 or the second quartile. Then um, let's look at 73. If we know the um, score of 73 is equal to the 70th fifth percentile, then what can we say it's quartile, what quartile is it equal to? Well, as the 70th, per, 70th fifth percentile is equal to the third quartile, we can say that 73 equals the third quartile. Now that we have a basic understanding of percentiles and quartiles, and as you can um, see, or as I hope you're seeing, what these are helping us do is understand the specific position of a score. 
So it's not necessarily helping us understand the distribution as we um, as we as we looked at as at um, oh as we looked at whenever we were looking at measures of central tendency in dispersion. So measures of central tendency in dispersion help us understand the overall distribution, whereas percentiles and quartiles help us understand a specific score and how where it lies within that distribution. So I'm hoping you're understanding that difference. Now before we move on, let's go ahead and talk briefly about the standard scores. Um, Standard scores are how many standard deviations a score or an element is from the mean. So standard scores are important for the reason of convenience and comparability of different data sets and it makes it easier to interpret. And probably the most common standard score used is the z-score and that's what we're going to focus on next. So as I said, a z-score is a standardized score. Here we see the formula for a z-score. First we see the formula for a population and then we see one for a sample. The formula for the sample is z is equal to x minus m and x denotes the value or the number that you're looking at divided by the standard deviation. Narratively a z-score specifies the precise location of each value within a distribution in relationship to the mean. Um, it gives us the number of standard deviations that a score lies either above or below the mean. The sign of the z-score, whether it's positive or negative, then signifies whether the score is above the mean or below the mean. So if a z-score is equal to zero, that means that it is equal to the mean. If a z-score is less than zero, that means then it's less than the mean. If a z-score is greater than zero, then that means it's greater than the mean. So if, it, if we have a z-score of one, that means that the number that we're looking at or the um, value that we're looking at is one standard deviation greater than the mean. Whereas if we had a z-score negative to minus one, let's say, that would mean that the uh, value that we're looking at is one standard deviation less than the mean. If we had a z-score then of two, we would say that the uh, value that we're looking at is two standard deviations greater than the mean, and so on and so forth. Let's take a look at z-scores a little bit more practically in light of an example scenario. Um, let's consider a student's sample population of normally distributed educational statistics final exam scores that have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. If we know this, what can we say about an individual who scores 130? Well, we can say something about that score if we know its z-score. And remember, to calculate the z-score, what we will um, do is we'll take x minus the mean, so 130 minus the mean of 100, divided by the standard deviation of 15. And what we find out is, is that the score of 130 has a z-score of plus 2. So what does this z-score of plus 2 mean? Well, based on what we just talked about, the score is two standard deviations above the mean. Now here it's important to note by convention, outcomes that have z-score values less than minus 1.96 or greater than 1.96 are usually viewed as unusual or extreme. In a normal distribution, what we know is, is that about 2.5% of the area lies below um, the z-score of minus 1.96 and 2.5% of the area lies above the z-score of plus uh, 1.96. So together, these two tails make the most extreme 5% of the outcomes in the distribution of scores. That's why we would consider scores above above a 196 unusual as well as scores below a 1.96 unusual. So going back to our example, what can we say about our score of 130 that has a z-score of 2? Well, based on convention, can we not say that this, the person that scored 130 on the educational statistics file or final was extremely high?
Let's consider extreme or unusual z-scores in light of another example. Let's consider extreme z-scores in terms of height. We know that women's height in the U.S. is approximately normally distributed with a mean of 64 inches and a standard deviation of 2.56 inches. Now, I want you to consider that you walk into a room of women and what you see is a woman who's 67 inches tall or 66 inches tall and a woman who is 71 inches tall. Okay, so you see these two women. Which woman are you more likely to take note of? The one that's 66 inches or the one that's 71 inches? You probably said the one that's 71 inches because we know that the average height of a woman is 64 inches. So most of the women in the room are going to be around 64 inches and 66 is close to 64. However, 71 is not so close and chances are the woman who's 71 inches is going to look a lot taller than everyone else in the room. In fact, her height may be considered unusual or extreme. Now let's look at these two women's z-scores um, and see if the, if the conclusion we just made holds true. Here we'll see that the woman that was 66 inches, if we calculate her z-score by taking her, um, her inches minus her or minus the mean divided by the standard deviation, that her z-score is 1.17. And what we note by convention is this is an unusual or extreme. We can then calculate the uh, z-score for the woman that's 71 inches. And what we note here is that her z-score is 2.73. And by convention, that's above a 1.96. And therefore, her height could be considered extreme. Now, understanding z-scores can be helpful in many ways because z-scores really help us understand a person's position in a distribution. We just looked at the example of height, but let's look at how a z-score may be useful if we go back to our educational example. An educator may want to know, again, um, may want to know how, or better understands, let's say, a specific student's achievement score on multiple assignments in a course. Um, or on a specific assignment in a course. Examining z-scores for a student on each assignment or multiple assignments can inform the educator if a specific student is performing average or extremely high or extremely low and this can then inform their instruction. So again, um, a z-score helps inform the position of one score, which is a little different than standard deviation and mean, which tells us about the entire distribution. Now that we understand um, z-scores, let's move on and talk a little bit about how to calculate both them and other descriptive statistics in SPSS. Descriptive statistics can be calculated using three different functions, or primarily three different functions in SPSS, and that's frequencies, descriptives, and explore. Now, there's some overlap in these functions in that they calculate mean and standard deviation. However, they do have different features. For example, frequency allows us to calculate specific percentiles, whereas the explore function only, allow, or only calculates uh, percentiles preset by the SPSS software. And the frequency function also allows you to um, look at one variable at a time. However, the explore function enables you to examine a variable disaggregated by another variable. So if I wanted to look at, let's say, course points disaggregated by gender or ethnicity, I would use the explore function. Whereas if I was just interested in examining course points, I might use the frequency function. So I encourage you to explore the different functions um, in which you can calculate the descriptive statistics in SPSS. And again, those functions are frequency, descriptives, and explore. If you're interested in calculating a z-score, then you'll want to use the descriptives function. So you'll go to Analyze Descriptive Statistics and click Descriptives. Once you've done that, you'll choose what variable you want to analyze. And below the variable list, what you'll see is a little button that you can tick that says Save Standardized Values as Variables. If you desire to calculate 
the z-scores for your entire sample population you tick this and then you tick OK so that's how you calculate z-scores in SPSS this now concludes part two of our tutorial on descriptive statistics. You should now be able to identify and provide examples of different measures of position, including percentiles, quartiles, and z-scores. And you should also understand how to calculate descriptive statistics, and specifically z-scores in SPSS.